Hey, I, uh, the, I am Sophia McCusker. I work as the nursery technician in the nursery here, and they let me into the Arboretum to talk some Gardening 101. <laughs> um, first, we've got Michael Steele. Um, he's an intern. He's coming Matthew, to... Matthew, yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, he's going to be teaching us yeah. about some uh, young tree pruning and what, what to do if your tree, if you go to the store and buy a tree and, you know, maybe you're not sure the branching structure is good or what we do. Yes. Hello there. Um, so, yes, I'm going to talk about um, tree or shrub pruning for the month of August. Typically, August is not a time where you're doing major tree or shrub pruning. A lot of time that's in the winter or spring, but you still can do some pruning as needed um, in August. Um, we've had quite a lot of rain in Raleigh recently, so you're probably gonna see a lot of uh, vigorous lush growth on your trees and shrubs. Um, so this will be kind of um, a good representation of what type of pruning you might be doing at this time of year. Um, it's mainly just gonna be light pruning, kind of as a rule of thumb, maybe uh, cut cut things off no more that are or that are not longer than 18 inches long. Kind of a rule of thumb, that doesn't have to be exactly like that. But um, so for some things to look for here, I have some uh, tree examples I brought out. Um, this could be representative of a tree you still have in a pod or in the ground. Um, so this is a, a Coralis tree here, uh, or hazel. So what things you'll look for, some light pruning you can do this time of year. Um, will be some of these lower branches. If you want to kind of help get it more of a um, upright structure, you can take some of these off. Of course, if possible, make sure your uh, pruners are uh, sanitized before you use them. Um, so yeah, just cutting off some of the um, lower small twigs on there to direct the growth more upright. So you can see this um, kind of like a sucker is starting to overtake the canopy and you will want to Take that off as well and just make sure you get um, decently close to the trunk, not too too much. You leave just a very tiny kind of collar on there for it to heal. Um, so that's about what you need to do for a tree like that. Uh, as well, um, we've got this evergreen magnolia uh, cultivar. This one's called copper talica. Um, so it's a very similar thing you'll be doing, uh, just cutting off some suckers or uh, low sprouts on there. And yeah, nothing too, too much. And that'll just give the tree a good um, uh, uh, to base from as it grows uh, larger. Now for, um, you might need to do a little more pruning sometimes other than just the lower sprouts. Um, if you need to do a little bit of canopy shaping, that is possible. You can, you can do that this time of year. Um, so for like this, uh, this is a Cornus capitata dogwood evergreen. Uh, this one's called mountain uh, moon. So for like what you could do is uh, you got some uh, outer growth on here and you want to kind of maintain the symmetry of the crown. You can take off some of those. Um, you'll want to try to find where well, you'll want to prune where uh, there, there's some uh, leaves coming out. You don't want to leave kind of a, a stick, a stick like like this uh, coming out there. So you'll just prune it to right, right about there, and it'll look nice and tidy, and it won't uh, die on the on the end there. Uh, it has a new point of growth from that point. Um, so similar, similarly up up here, we'll do the same thing. And then, of course, like the others, just some lower sprouts as well. You can remove and you know, get this tree rehabilitated. And you can use these same principles on trees that are um, even larger in your landscape. Again, you're not doing major pruning, but just shaping the canopy, removing suckers or water sprouts lower down on the tree. Um, so let me get these here. We can see what this looks like completed. So that's probably about good of, or uh, a good gauge of what you would do for a tree like this. Now for um, like a shrub, uh, again, we're doing only light pruning right now. 
this uh, uh, variegated Japanese holly is uh, it has a very nice shape to it already. It's pretty symmetrical. Um, this will just demonstrate what I kind of like to call selective pruning. Um, so basically, you're just kind of looking at it from above. Some uh, sprouts that or twigs uh, growth that come out uh, a lot more than the rest of the main kind of inner canopy you'll be cutting off. So uh, just kind of a selective cut like that. Just find the ones that are uh, sticking out more than others. There's not any like perfect uh, way to do it. Just kind of gauge it and just see how it looks as you're going. And again, for um, uh, broadleaf evergreens like this, uh, you may be able to get away with using, using an electric uh, trimmer, especially if it's a larger uh, shrub. Uh, but if the, when the leaves are bigger on a broadleaf evergreen like this, um, you, it's best to use uh, snippers or pruners uh, it, so it won't uh, tear the leaves up. So. so yeah, it's about just kind of shaping it up and uh, that's about a good gauge of uh, what you would do. And you could go tighter if you wanted, not just not too much. Again, we're not doing any extreme pruning here in August. So, so yeah, so that basically sums it up. And um, yeah, I, I wouldn't prune any later than um, August unless you absolutely have to, if it's interfering with your sidewalk or uh, branches or something like that. But again, that's basically what you'd be doing for this time of year in August. Awesome. Yeah, I like to call those uh, hollies. Those are the ones you get this, you see turned into meatballs because people shear them with the shears. So they can be something else. They don't have to be the meatballs. Um, next up, we have Dylan Winstead. Uh, he will be talking a little bit about some cuttings. Uh, he's going to show us how to do camellia cuttings because that is, it is a good time of year to do those. Thank you for the introduction, Sophia. My name is Dylan Winstead and I'll be talking to you about camellia cuttings. So like she said, it is a good time of year to do camellia cuttings. And I mean, everybody has a camellia in their yard, it seems. And so cuttings can be sort of like pruning in a way of the tree, but you're going to want to be a little bit more specific mm. with what okay. you want to go and cut. Like specifically with camellias, you're going to want the new year's growth. So that meaning not old wood stuff that came from this year. And I don't know if you can see it, but it's kind of, you can tell the color difference between the new growth and the old growth. And that's what you're going to want to use for your cuttings. And so you're going to take your clean shears that you have and you're going to make a cut right below the node, have a fresh cut on there. And then you're gonna want to take your rooting hormones. We're using a gel for this camellia. You could use powder if you wanted, but we're using gel. And for to prevent like cross-contamination between plants, you're gonna wanna pour your gel into a separate container. Pour it into a separate container nice little glob of it right there so now we have our stuff and you're gonna you now pop off a couple of the leaves because you don't really need them and sure enough you're just gonna dip it right in the gel and stick it and so now you have a cutting but what you can also do with camellias is they you could take a single leaf cutting and stick this and do a single cutting. For personal preferences, you can cut the leaves to make it take up less space. You know, and stick. You're gonna wanna keep the soil evenly moist throughout the entire thing because the leaves are struggling to train. There's a whole bunch of science stuff involved that I don't want to get too into. It's 101. So you're just going to dip it in the hormones, stick it, keep it moist. And a good way to keep it moist is making a little greenhouse of your own. 
where you just take your pot, put a little bamboo stake in it or whatever you have to stake it up. Just put a nice little bag over top of it. Help keep everything in there nice and humid. Tuck it in there. And now you have a little greenhouse. If it's getting too hot in there, you can just pop the bag open a little bit. Very, very useful way to, you know, root your own cuttings of camellia. Hey Dylan, could you speak briefly on uh, how big the cutting should be? Sure. So uh, when you take it off the plant, you're going to want a good amount of nodes, probably around five or so. And so you can, you know, come in here, cut that off, take off a couple of these leaves and stick that. Or you could, oh, excuse me, I am so sorry. Or you could do, you know, just the single node. It really is up to you with how much space you have and how many you're trying to successfully root. If that answers the question. Any other questions before my nose starts running even more? Uh, really any soil will be fine, but probably just some like potting mix that you would normally use for pretty much anything else. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Oh, am I next? I'm next. Uh, next, we have Danielle Clade, and she's going to be talking to us about the proper ways to watering and some ways where we're, we might think we're doing a good job watering, but... All right, now you should be able to hear me. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple different examples. I'm going to show you the container examples and then an in-ground example, but I wanted to show you if, like our basic watering tools. Um, in the Arboretum, we usually use the hose, and I... We prefer to use one that has a diffuser like this so it doesn't have like a harsh um, stream because that can kind of wash away your soil or substrate. Um, these kind of watering cans are really common, but we kind of stay away from them just because of the open spout. It doesn't diffuse the water and it doesn't infiltrate as well as something that is more evenly spread. Um, and I wanted to show you with some of these containers First, these are our sacrifice plants that we let dry out a lot. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to show you how, I'm gonna, my, yeah, there we go. So I'm gonna water it. <laughs> and it looks like it got a ton of water. Um, but the problem with these plants and this one also, I can show you in this one. is because they're so dry, if I go ahead and pull this out of the pot and break it open, it's actually like completely dry on the inside still. And I'll show you on this one also. This is still dry in the center where the roots would be. So that is a good example of when your plants like dry out a ton. And um, the reason that happens is a lot of potting mixes have like a wetting agent in the, um, in the mix and after a while that kind of gets washed out and no longer kind of infiltrates the water as well. So in those cases you kind of want to let the water filter through the pot and then you might have to come back a couple times to really make sure that it gets soaked in. Um, I want to show you a good example here of a plant that's not dead <laughs> and you can kind of see it starts to pull up at the top so I kind of stopped watering it for just a second, letting it infiltrate. And even though it might be coming out of the bottom holes, you might think, oh, like the whole pot is saturated. Um, it probably is channeling down the sides of the pot. So you still just, it takes longer than you might like really think it will, but it's good to give it a good soak. And then I just wanted to talk real quick about in-ground plants. Um, they won't dry out as quickly, luckily, but um, the diffused water is still really good for this because it won't cause as much of the water running away, kind of like it is right here. But I stop watering it for just a second. I'm going to let it infiltrate again, and this might happen to a lot of your 
um, in-ground plants if it's really hot and dry outside. And you might want to come back later to like really water it in more to make sure that it's actually saturating the root zone. Otherwise, it might just be kind of running off in channels. And that is about it for basic watering tips. Thanks. So next we're talking about dividing some uh, irises. A lot of your irises will probably not look great right now. Um, and Michael Entwistle is going to give us a little, uh, a little bit of information on how to spruce them up. Indeed. Thank you, Sophia. Um, yeah, so these are bearded irises. Uh, this is flower shower, which is purple uh, dwarf form, about 16 to 18 inches tall uh, when it's mature and when it's flowering. Um, but like Sophia said, this time of year, irises tend to go semi-dormant. semi, semi -dormant. Uh, They aren't flowering anyway. And so now is a perfect time to divide them. Uh, and you might want to divide your irises if you've had really good blooms in the past, but then this year they aren't as impressive as they were previously. Uh, they could just be getting overgrown. And so they could do with a nice little division. So the way you want to divide it, uh, this is just pulled out of the ground with the, with the spading fork, but you could use a lot of different things, a, a, a shovel and just dig it shallow. Um, so the idea is you can just take the rhizome and clean it off a little bit. You can break off the old growth uh, as needed, but you get one shock of foliage and then the rhizome underneath it as well as the roots. And then this is good to go. This is this is perfect and you can plant it just like that. Um, and then if you want to see how to plant it, you want to make sure that you get all of the um, the roots under soil but the actual rhizome itself you want to be uncovered. So you want that open to the actual air. Um, hmm? Yes, absolutely. So there you go. So you can see the rhizome above the, oh, you can still see some of the roots there, but you can see the rhizome above the soil, but the roots are underneath it. Uh, and then you can take your pruners and just give a little cut so that you don't have a whole sail sticking up 10 inches into the air so that it just blows over and you have to keep on replanting it. Um, this, here's, a, here's an example of what I was talking about with the older growth. Um, so all you need for this is just one of these. You just need the resin that's specifically, that's connected directly to the foliage. But all of this older growth, you actually can just break off and compost. You don't need any of that. So every single one of these is an individual plant that you can plant or give to people. This is a really, really nice way to just share the love. Um, I know irises are really common, common landscape plants. They're gorgeous. A lot of people absolutely love them. So yeah, you could break them off and give them to your friends. Um, depending on what you're dividing, for this one, the rhizome is, is fairly brittle and easy to just snap off by hand. But um, one tool that can be really useful uh, is a soil knife. And so this can be helpful in uh, cutting the, the rhizome and separating it, dividing it, uh, and also in planting the plants as well. So in, uh, in one tool, you can use it. It's not necessary, but it can, ex it can expedite the process. Um, like I said, this is flower shower. This is a repeated blooming iris. Um, and I think we're gonna have this in some distributions coming up. So if you're interested in a dwarf form, uh, re-blooming bearded iris, then you might be in luck. So yeah, are there any questions? There are a few questions, but we can uh, do a little Q and A with everybody now. Um, okay. Just to get you started though, um, one, one person asked, should I divide Narcissus now or wait till the fall? I mean, you can, you can, you can divide them now if you want to. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and somebody asked, <laughs> it's just a bunch of specific questions about specific plants. So like they're asking about uh, cannas, they're asking about, uh, <laughs> Siberian irises. Yeah. Tim is approaching to answer Tim all of your approaching. specific say, plant uh, question needs. 
I think it's a good time to do Canis. Yeah. Yeah, Canis. Canis, Canis. Be, yeah. yeah, Canis would be great now, as yeah. Sophia has mentioned. Um, uh, no problem with those. Siberian Iris, you could probably do now as well. Um, the thing with the bearded iris, they're semi-dormant right now, so it's a perfect time to do it. The Siberian Iris, they're a little more active growing, but this you could easily do it with no problem as well. Okay, uh, I guess about irises, should they be trimmed back every year after bloom? I would, I would say so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I personally don't like how the foliage looks uh, when it's just left to its own devices, so... I think I, it's I, personal preference. Exactly. Yeah. I would. Yeah. Well, that's why I said What I you would. can simply yeah. do is like, especially in the bearded iris, the, the take off the old um, brown foliage at the base, it will come right up uh, off yeah. the, the, um, the fans very easily. Some others like Siberian iris and stuff, those are much more complicated. I mean, they're denser. They're not as easy to do that with. And so I typically don't touch them too much. But the bearded iris are really easy to clean up. Um, and it'll give you a fresh start for the fall. I don't cut them back unless it's uh, like I'm dividing them um, to actually to the fans like that. But that is perfect. Like um, Michael said, they act as sails whenever they're uh, freshly replanted. So you want to cut them back to so that they stay in the ground. And that's the way you're going to buy them too in the fall if you buy them bare roots. So yeah. Someone's asking, why is the entire rhizome exposed to the air? Why do you not want to cover it with any soil? Okay, um, bearded iris in general um, grow that way. They do not grow with their rhizomes buried. They are a surface growing rhizome. Uh, other iris species will be, can be submerged uh, yeah, below the soil level, but it just depends on the type of iris. Some iris are actually bulbous, some uh, are just totally fibrous rooted. Your beard, I mean, your uh, Siberian iris, they have a rhizome, but it's much more reduced. That one's going to want to be more um, uh, lower in the soil line uh, level, but your uh, bearded iris come from the Mediterranean climate where there's very little organic matter on that. Okay, someone's asking how often should outdoor plants be watered? Depends on the Yeah, water. it really does depend on the plant and the size of the plant and the location also. If it's in direct sun, it's probably gonna dry out a lot quicker. Um, it, yeah, it really depends on a lot of things. Depends on the um, weather a lot. If it's mm -hmm. 95 degrees, probably almost every day. Yeah. How established the plant is? Yeah. yeah. Especially in a container? <laughs> Containers a lot more than in ground plants, in yeah. my experience. And um, what, we'll, what I'll do down in the nursery a lot of times is feel the weight of the pot. Um, if you water it and it still feels light, like, water it more. <laughs> you'll yeah. kind of, once you start doing that, you'll kind of get a feel for the weight and what is moist versus what is dry. And you can just pick it up and... It'll be pretty heavy if it's like yeah. actually soaked through, yeah. It's a little harder with big like container plantings of annuals and stuff, but. Okay, how long will it take a camellia cutting to root? They're a little slower than, they're not a fast rooting plant. So I'd say a couple of months probably to actually start to root in. Um, you'll start to get callus probably in the first couple of weeks, which is some adventitious growth, um, which can turn into the roots themselves, but it's gonna take probably two months at least to start getting some real roots. Yeah, I think we, I took some, we took some camellia cuttings maybe three weeks ago, two weeks ago, and I don't see any roots on them yet. So it'll take time. Someone's asking, how do you determine what iris you have when gifted to you through a plant swap? <laughs> <laughs> that is, um, yeah, always a challenge right there. <laughs> There's literally thousands and thousands of irises that have been selected, and not just of bearded irises, but of other types of irises. There's several different groups of irises. So, yeah, you, you need to, know, um, you know. You, if you have an iris expert, there are there is an iris, uh, so the iris society, you can, American Iris Society, you can look up online. That may, might be somewhat useful to figuring out some of it. Or if you know someone in the iris society, they might be able to help you out too. Or you might be able to find a reference online. But so, establishing the, the group of irises yeah. that it is in is easier than finding yeah. the exact species. Yeah. Definitely. Yes. And variety. Yes. Yeah. There's so many types. Yeah. yeah. Um, somebody's, uh, still talking about irises, uh, somebody says, oh goodness, we keep getting new questions and the thing keeps scrolling away. <laughs> okay. Somebody has been less attentive with dividing beer bearded irises for years and they're not as prolific now. Is there redemption? Yes. Divide them. Yeah. Yep. So dividing them will loosen up the roots and take out a lot of that old dead, 
uh, rhizome mm -hmm. and make sure they're getting as much sun as possible would be one thing. They aren't heavy feeders, the bearded iris in general. So the soil doesn't have to be real rich, but uh, they do need light. So if they're getting overshadowed by something else, including themselves, the uh, vigor will often go down, but they'll rapidly uh, typically recover if you get them back out into um, giving them some space and light. Um, so what you could do is you could divide it and then replant just like the best ones. three of these yeah. Yeah. in that same spot and then share them with other people. Yeah, don't plant all 500 back into the same spot. So. <laughs> That's okay. probably why someone got the irises from a plant swap is because... <laughs> Those are the vigorous ones. They're the ones. <laughs> Someone's asking, where should you put the camellia cuttings? Can you put them outdoors? You want me to answer? Okay. I can do you can, or, or do you want to do it? I mean, I can do it. Yeah. Um, not in this heat. <laughs> <laughs> I would put them in, uh, I would put them in like a inside, preferably filtered light. You don't want a lot of, you don't want direct sunlight um, or they will dry out. Uh, but a windowsill is good. Keep them moist. You want to make sure the moisture um, on that bag or sometimes, or you can get domes. Um, you know, make sure there's a little bit of moisture on there, but it's not like a sauna. You can have them outside, but if you're gonna do it outside, put them in a shaded place. Don't have them in direct sunlight whatsoever, because that will actually toast. Yeah. So. And someone's also asking, is misting a good strategy for additional? Oh, okay, no, this isn't about, this isn't about propagation. This is about watering outside. They're asking if misting is a good strategy for additional watering slash scorch prevention for plants in the ground during very hot days. Um, I, I don't really do Ooh. misting and I haven't really heard much about misting. I always feel like it, it's not gonna do much just because it's gonna dry really quickly. If you're just putting a little bit of mist, it's probably gonna dry within like it 10, might, 15 minutes. It might cool them down a little bit, but it also depends greatly on the plant. Um, some plants yeah. will melt if you put water on them mm -hmm. and it's very hot. <laughs> Fuzzy leaf plants despise it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Don't water begonias in direct sun. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Someone says they have squirrels pulling up and eating their bearded iris. Is there any way to prevent this? <laughs> um, not have squirrels. <laughs> some, uh, you could try um, um, there's some, sprays, yeah. some of the repellents. Yeah. Some of the repellents, they're oil-based, so they'll last a few weeks. You'll have to reapply it, but it may be enough to deter them. Pepper oil, maybe? A lot of the sprays have pepper oil in them. Yeah. Capsicums. Yeah. yeah. But Capsicum. Relocate the squirrel. No, don't do that. Just let the squirrel live. Share the, just share nature with the squirrels. Okay, someone's asking, are there other cuttings that can be done now? Clethra Elysium Zyrilla, specifically. Elysium? Um, yeah, Clethra, definitely you could do now. Elysium, probably. Um, Zyrilla, Zyrilla, Zyrilla. That I, doesn't ring a bell. I can't think what that is offhand. Uh, I don't know that one. <laughs> Stumped Tim, good job. <laughs> I'd have to look it up. But definitely cle uh, Clethra, uh, easy at this time of the year in the summer. So, yeah. Okay, someone, you can says, they have, the same way. someone says they have fruit trees that look healthy, get fruit blossoms and small fruit, but they fall off before they get edible fruit. That's too vague. That I hate bad. to say it. I'm sorry. Uh, and the, if fruit or, I mean, that's a that totally a different thing. Hole. Yeah. yeah. There, I need to add <laughs> a lot more information. Yeah. Okay. Uh, going back to watering, what time of day should you water outdoors? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm actually not sure what time of day would be best. I always been morning. Michael or Matthew? Yeah. Uh, best time is um, even before the sun comes up is good. Um, uh, it's a really good point to like get the plant hydrated before the sun gets hot or even comes up as well. Um, so you, I think the rule of thumb was you don't want to do it, uh, maybe like later than noon or something like that. I mean, you can still water something if you have to, but um, that, that's basically, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it also 
uh, limiting the time when it is dark and wet because that one that can yes. be when fungal issues yeah. develop. Not too early then. So you don't want to do it too late in the evening so that it doesn't set wet overnight and then but you can start very early in the morning before the light comes out and then it will um, um, get uh, dry off as the day progresses but if the plant needs it well, you can water any time of the day. Hey, yeah. yeah, so, and I often have to do that here in the garden because we don't have irrigation in some places that it's automated, so. Mm -hmm. And in the nursery with small containers, you know, you've got to water, you might have to water them a couple times a day. And there's two more, two more questions about specific cuttings to be taken. How about hollies? How about oak leaf hydrangeas? A holly, it might depend on the species uh, and their parentage. So I um, like the deciduous hollies are not going to root very well at this time of year. Some of the evergreen ones probably will. Some of them not. They're often done as uh, I do the, often do them in the winter as hardwood cuttings. Um, though there, it doesn't mean they won't root now. Um, we did, I think, um, I like vomitorias or crinatas. Which was it? It was a it was, vomitoria, actually. I it think. was vomitoria. And yep. um, this summer, and they're fine summer rooting. I've, I've never succeeded in winter rooting those. We personally. did them. That was a while ago. Yeah, I but believe still, that it's only it's, it, this summer went yeah. on soft the softwood. But, um, uh, and what was the other plant that you just mentioned? Um, oak leaf hydrangea. Oak leaf hydrangea. Yep, Definitely, you could do time. that now if you get the soft cuttings. Um, there's still often uh, softwood on those. Okay. And uh, that looks like that's all the questions we've got in the chat. Uh, so just thank you everybody for joining us for this midweek program today. It was a great success, I should say myself. Thank you to all the interns for sharing their knowledge with us and experience. It is greatly appreciated. I learned a bunch. I'm sure everybody at home learned a bunch. So thank you so much, everybody. We'll, yes, as Catherine's saying in the chat, we'll get this posted onto our YouTube channel in a few days. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, thanks a bunch. Y'all have a good one.